Thank you. We're going to see the uh, next generation data center and how you can define your infrastructure. We'll see how you can design your data center, your infrastructure to support any application, any to any flow, whatever the application is, whether it's a uh, virtualized environment, big data, web 2.0. We'll see how you can scale your virtualized environment, so your layer 2 infrastructure, virtualized, and also how to define your infrastructure, whether it's physical or virtualized, to have a more efficient workflow. Arista is providing 10, 40, and 100 gig switches. It was founded in 2004. We released the first products in 2008. We've got today about over 2,000 customers, big and small as well as over 600 employees across the world. So profitable, self-financed, pre-IPO company founded by David Sheraton and Andy Bechtelsheim in 2004. Um, just a background on Andy Bechtelsheim, he founded Sun Microsystem um, with, along with uh, his, um, his friend David Sheraton. We, they both founded Granite System, if you might know, um, purchased later by, uh, by Cisco. Both Andy Bechtelsheim and David Sheraton were the first initial investors in Google. Today, those two wealthy people, so own privately Arista Networks, very um, robust financially. But those two people, what led them into creating and leading that company, Arista, is for the technology passion. They don't need the money. What they are driving with Arista is their passion for the technology and leading the best hardware and software networking in the industry. We'll look at the um, data center transport in your infrastructure. The foundation of the next generation data center is performance, a, an infrastructure that will deliver the throughput bandwidth and different criteria that you require for supporting your different applications. This, the common topology to support that is a cluster topology based on spine and leaf. Spine being, which may know as the core, leaf is the, um, the access which is whether you have, um, whatever your criteria has, are um, such as the port density, the port count, the bandwidth requirement, the scale of your network, they will all be matched with a common um, kind of equation that will result in different architecture, yes, but following that same exact model as a cluster topology, always two layer, spine and leaf. That architecture scale horizontally. You can add some ports by adding some devices in the leaf. You can maintain the throughput in your architecture as you scale by adding devices in the spine. That's like a fabric in a chassis. So that architecture provides you a consistent any to any performance in your network, whether it's in terms of bandwidth, latency, you can have an any-to-any -any communication having the same performance as you scale from small to medium to large. The architecture can be non-blocking, can be blocking depending on your requirements. And it's very simple to grow because you just need to add some devices as you grow at a linear rate. So the cost of growing your network, of scaling net your network is linear. You don't have those big steps as when you create s new silos and need to m multi layer your network. Today the scale of a data center at purely layer 2 can be achieved with existing technologies, LACP, Ethernet. With devices today that can have hundreds or uh, thousand 10 gig ports, non blocking in a single chassis. With two devices you've got 2,000 10 gig ports non blocking. So today, in a virtualized environment, with each 10 gig host being able to hold, let's say, 50 or 100 VMs, you can already reach in your data center 100,000, 200,000 MAC addresses in your network. So the limitation in your network is not any more the port count or port density that the devices can provide you, but the limitation of the standard, the traditional, the, the layer two technology, you will be limited by the amount of VLAN, 4094. You will be limited by the physical limitation of the boxes. Those devices here have a certain amount of TCAM. They can support a certain amount of MAC addresses and ARP addresses. 
but not to the scale that's provided by the high density devices. So yes, you can reach thousand, two thousand, several thousand 10 gig ports, but you will hit before that, much before that, the limitation of the layer two, being the amount of VLANs, the, ama the amount of MAC addresses, the amount of ARP resolution you can do on your layer two infrastructure. To go beyond that, what you need to do is to decouple the physical infrastructure from your virtualized infrastructure, removing the, limitation, the physical limitation out of your infrastructure. So th the architecture is based on that decoupling from the physical layer, th the um, physical layer, the physical infrastructure from the virtualized network. We're building a physical transport that's there to provide the bandwidth, the performance that you need. We mentioned port can, port density, throughput, latency, and so on. Those are criteria for a physical infrastructure that, that's becoming a, um, a delivery for bandwidth, for throughput. That allow you to have a standardized infrastructure that can carry many different kinds of applications, a cloud network, a private cloud, a public cloud, several clouds, big data, web 2.0, can all run on the same standardized physical infrastructure. And the scaling is enabled by running layer 3. So by running layer 3, you overcome the scale and limitation of the layer 2 residing on the physical infrastructure. With the class topology and using the spine, you use ECMP multipathing, so you are using the same protocol as you are using today, such as OSPF, BGP, ISIS, IP. Protocols that are standard, well-known, robust, well-established, and well-known. So you've got all the domain of expertise in this field. It's not a new protocol, it's just the standard layer 3. You increase the resilience because you reduce the domain of failure each layer to the main is limited to a top of rack, for example. In a spine that's composed of four, you lose a device, you just lose 25% of your, of your throughput. In a spine of eight, it's just 12%. So are in, you are increasing the reliability. And you have enabled the scale for your physical infrastructure to support an increasing east-west traffic in your data center. Now, the overlay network, and Ivan has, has talked about it extensively this morning, allow to abstract the virtualized environment from the physical environment. Now, the layer three underlying physical infrastructure is decoupled from uh, the uh, virtualized environment. And the physical infrastructure just becomes an infrastructure for transporting IP. It's an IP fabric just delivering bandwidth throughput for the virtualized different services above it in the overlay network. So the overlay network will be there to virtualize the connectivity between end nodes, whether they are virtualized or physical. And that's minimizing the operational challenges in the data center by providing that decoupling. The physical layer 3 infrastructure becomes the, the um, your fabric, your core network that you manage. You are managing IP. The only thing that the physical infrastructure We'll see just IP packet. It's running layer three, purely layer three. You see IP packets. You see different routes. You don't see the under the underneath Ethernet layer two communication that that we ha that um, take place between the different layer two nodes. The overlay network has abstracted the virtualized environment from the physical infrastructure. So now the different nodes can communicate with each other, whether it's they are virtual or physical, virtual to physical, physical to physical. It's just layer two communication across, across your, in your overlay network. And that traverses transparently your layer three fabric, the underlying layer three infrastructure that just carries IP packets. The, the coupling allow total transparency for the physical infrastructure, my layer three fabric here, that's just IP. I don't know whether that's two layer two nodes communicating with each other. To that infrastructure, that's just IP packets going from one source to a destination. For the overlay network, two nodes communicating with each other, they're just exchanging 
Ethernet frames. They don't know that the underlying is, is got a, a layer three fabric. It doesn't know that's an IP network. The overlay network has satisfied the layer two communication across a medium, small, very large, whatever the scale of that network is, it can scale, it's flexible. As a brief uh, review of the VXLAN, it's a layer two encapsulation across the layer three network. The layer two devices, whether they are virtual or physical, will get their traffic encapsulated into IP and crossing the layer three network. Total transparency between the layer three and the layer two. And with a bigger picture, what we've got here is a spine lift topology with four spine devices. There's the CMP. You might recognize the routing table here. It's simply that we've got several paths, obviously, for a um, single destination. What the uh, that layer three infrastructure will do is just route from VTAP between VTAPs. That's my overlay network, as VXLAN, as an example. It will route packet between, for example, this VTAP here, so VTAP for VXLAN termination endpoint, source packet 10.10.10.1, .10 .10 that's on your core, your backbone infrastructure, routed to destination, for example, 10.10.40.1. .10 that's the layer three infrastructure. On the layer two side, on the virtualized network, you've got different tenants, green tenant, blue tenant, in the corner left, we've got a, a green tenant that's on a um, it's that's a VM residing in a hypervisor, and a hypervisor contains the virtual the VXLAN termination endpoint, the VTAP. That's the hypervisor in that case that will do the encapsulation. On the other side, we've got some other devices, physical devices here that can do VTAP as well. Providing VXLAN overlay connectivity to some physical devices, such as firewall, storage, routers. And now my tenant, green here in this example, has got a single layer to domain across different racks, across different, between different devices, whether they are virtual or physical. It has got a physical storage, it has got access to a um, and a one access, for example, with different VRFs here. So it has got access to virtual resources as well as physical. VNIs are the um, VXLAN network ident identifier across 24 bits that provides 16.7 million different identifier. So you go much beyond your traditional 4094, 96 VLANs in the traditional layer two. So with the overlay network dissociated, decoupled from the physical infrastructure, we're allowed to scale very large. You, can, you don't need to consume all those MAC addresses because the MAC addresses are consumed only on a single rack basis. The same for the ARP resolution that goes to the gateway. And the scale of VLAN for the multi tenancy is now to the 16.7 million. So we've reached the scaling required for the next generation data center for model for modern uh, cloud scale. Now that there's all that um, physical infrastructure to support my scaling, but my cloud, you've got your orchestration, you've got different elements in your infrastructure that you can define, that you can let your application define. The goal is to make the workflow easier, improve the network efficiency in your network. The ability to define your infrastructure um, is founded by a programmability of, the, of the, this infrastructure. And that relies on an operating system that will allow you to, to control it. And how do you control your infrastructure? What do you want to control it from? from something that's provided by a vendor or by your orchestration tool of choice. So you've got the ability to use 
OpenStack, for example, there's XMPP based on, on Jabber. You've got OpenFlow. You've got the ability to run different kind of scripts, run from um, VMware, there's Microsoft OMI, and so on, different APIs that could be some JSON, HTTP, HTTPS based APIs or NetConf. You can integrate automation tools to, to automate the deployment, such, such as Chef and Puppet, without forgetting the ability to preserve visibility in your, netwo in your network. As the workflows are going now anywhere, because you've got the performance on your infrastructure, to not assign resources to only a physical, uh, dedicated, specified physical location, your resources can be anywhere, all over the place. But you've got the ability to keep visibility on all that. Just an example of uh, what a, an API, lang API language could be. That's a JSON HTTP format. That's the ability to communicate with your network infrastructure using some languages that makes it easier to read and to configure your devices. Uh, machine language. Because the old days of configuring the network with manual scripts well, it doesn't scale when you want to interact the application with your infrastructure or the infrastructure services together. That's machine, you know, computers, services, co communicating with each other. And it's examples of what can be achieved. Here an example of use case of SDN. What we've got here is a what we've got here is uh, an example of four switches, some hosts. Host 1 communicating with host 2. Across switches. We've got firewalls here. And the traffic flow can be so crossing that firewall. That firewall here, because it's suffering, for example, a denial of service. With some of the APIs we've seen earlier, can instruct the switch most of the switches nowadays can do layer 2, layer 3, layer 4, access list filtering. So the goal for the security team is to block the denial of service as near to the source as possible. Could be a switch. Could be to increase the performance for better protection to offload the filtering capacity and let the firewall do what it's best at, more intelligent filtering on layer 7 or detection offloading all those rules onto hardware-capable filtering devices. And the, uh, another use case using that um, environment is the ability for the infrastructure <coughs> to detect the presence of some uh, um, virtual machines on a physical host, on the hypervisor. And when that virtual machine moves, from one physical host to another, from one hypervisor to another, then the switch can detect that move, know that the VM that was residing on an access port has moved side. And therefore, communicate with, so some again, some of the APIs we've seen, with the firewall, telling it, you were filtering earlier for that VM, allowing traffic. You don't need to do that anymore. However, the traffic now has moved, all the workflow has moved to another physical host. And that, that switch here has detected that VM coming along on an access port under that hypervisor and will instruct the firewall to create a new object or a new rule to allow filtering. So that has effectively transported profiles across the data center so that the VMs that have got no knowledge at all about where they're physically located. So that gives a physical awareness to the services, to the infrastructure that the VM alone doesn't have. And that allows the VM, the applications running on the VMs, to define automatically the infrastructure that it, it runs on, the networking infrastructure and the different services. So all those things are available today, that's things that can run already today. 
as an, as an exa as another example, using a load balancer in this case, we've got again some virtual machines that could be some physical hosts. What device first learns about a physical switch, a f physical server going down here, that's a, um, a physical server. The first one to detect it is the device directly attached, because that device here, a switch, will see the port going down. By detecting that event, a loss of service, it can instruct an F5 load balancer, for example, that the resources that were behind that have failed, and they can remove them from the available farm. So now, we are not anymore in the second kind of health check that the traditional services need to detect failure, because that's appalling. That's using health checks, polls, dead timers. Now it's trigger-based and we detect immediately. So within the microsecond, we can send an instruction to the service to instruct it that it needs to reconverge, allocate flows to other resources, because any flow being sent to that during those several seconds would be lost. And the another example with a bigger picture, again, two data centers, public access. They are VMs on hypervisors, on physical servers here. There's a network in each with different services. So not only the API's calls can instruct the different services to kind of configure profile for the dedicated uh, for these dedicated VMs, but once those VMs have been provisioned automatically with the orchestrator, along with the networking, because now it's possible to orchestrate the network with a OpenStack or any other or orchestrator. Then when things move or fails, if we take the example of a VM1 here, traffic in that data center is, well, traffic is going in and out through the services that have been configured for that specific VM. And when it moves, well, we talk again about informing local services about the changes, removing the entries for that specific VM that were in DC1. Now, moving them onto the services that are located inside DC2. So now, the VIP is for that VM that has moved will be available in a DC2 on that, on that um, service. Same for filtering, for routing and so on. So now what has that created is dynamically reconfigure the infrastructure to follow the VM, to follow the workflow. What has done is by differentiated advertisement onto the uh, public network now, we have not only changed how the traffic goes out of the data center, but also how it goes in. Traditionally, but a VM moving would have created some tromboning traffic because the VM would have potentially not be able in a large layer to network, whether it's virtualized or physical, been able to exit locally. So that's, that's first the ability to exit, to have a first hop redundant gateway that's local to the data center. So there are some technologies now to allow that. So first, the problem was to go out locally, not to trombone. Second is the return traffic. For the traffic coming in, traditionally traffic would have kept coming in that way across your potentially interlinked data center or inter-room. So now you've got the ability to influence that by automatically configuring your different services to attract traffic in the right position, in the right place. And that's how your different services, infrastructure services, are talking to each other. Another use case is the ability to have zero impact maintenance on your network by letting your infrastructure talk to each other. When you want to do some maintenance on a switch, you can inform the different services that there will be some work operated on this device. And all the workflow can be proactively moved aside by, for example, uh, putting those different workflow in maintenance mode, a graceful shutdown, and, and so on, so that the workflow will be moved away 
from that specific switch. With open protocols on the um, network infrastructure, it's possible to make the paths that are crossing that switch less attractive. Whether it's layer 2, layer 3, or some other way with open flow, it's possible to drain the traffic out of that switch so that upon completion, we've got both the workflows out of an access switch, for example, or the active traffic totally um, uh, totally drained from that specific switch so that the device is now alive but not running pr any production traffic at all, zero traffic. So it can be removed out of the, uh, the network. You can do maintenance on it, you can play with it, you can disconnect it. It has got no impact on the traffic. And upon completion of the maintenance, you've got the ability to do the reverse procedure by just reinstating the switch in uh, active mode, restore the ability for those services to allocate resources onto that uh, networking device, and with automatic snapshot, the ability to compare exactly what is done before and after. So all those use cases that we've seen us are actually e actual example of what was done for some uh, for some customers and what we've seen today is first basically fundamentals for your network infrastructure but something that can be sometimes a bit of an oversight for some the ability to scale but be flexible and the other network gives you the ability to ensure your physical infrastructure is something that you can control it's an IP fabric delivering bandwidth throughput like your bad bone today but you've got the ability with a network overlay to carry the layer 2 services that you need for a scalable cloud infrastructure. Thank you very much. If you've got any question, So thank you for your presentation.